We were the kings and queens of promise, the victims of ourselves, maybe the children of a lesser God between heaven and hell, heaven and hell. You know, the the lyrics of that song remind us of what we experience in this life, right? That, that we had this sense we were meant to be like kings and queens. And, and we get this little taste of heaven, of the love and joy and, and peace and goodness and creativity and compassion and life together. And then we're also the victims of ourselves. We experience something in this life gone terribly wrong. Anger and hatred and jealousy and division and deception and alienation and dishonesty, divorce, murder, war, a small taste of hell. We live between heaven and hell. But why? And you know, we've been four weeks in this series, we've been looking at heaven, and if you're just here for the first time today, I'm sorry. (laughs) You really need to go back and watch the last four weeks because today we're going to ask the question, what about hell? And let me just say, there's no way I'm going to cover everything in this one service. And and so I'm encouraging you to read along and imagine heaven during this series. In chapters 14 through 16, I really go into it more, but I'm going to try to give you a, a perspective that maybe you've never had before. Let me start with a story. Long before earth was created, God eternally existed. The God who is love and light and life is also a creator. And God created eternal creatures called angels. Angels were creatures of light, created to do God's will, created to love and glorify God forever. And they were given tasks. Some were messengers, some were servants. The most beautiful, powerful angel actually created music and worshiped worshiped in God's very presence. His name was light bearer. He was blameless, pure, creative, the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. He was placed in Eden, the garden of God in heaven. God himself appointed light bearer to be a guardian cherub. He was the most powerful angel and he was allowed to go into the most holy place, the holy mountain of God. He walked among the fiery stones of brilliance. He was in the most splendid place in all of heaven, the throne room of God. God loved him and declared, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. But God created the angels to love and to serve, which also meant that angels had a free will. They could choose. And something horrible happened in the heart of Lightbearer. His heart became proud because of his beauty. He corrupted his wisdom and his splendor. He said in his heart, I will rise above the throne of God. I will be like God. And wickedness was found in him. You were filled with violence and you sinned, God declared. So I drove you in disgrace from the mountain of God. I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. And light bearer, or Lucifer, was cast out of heaven. But not before he convinced a third of the angels that they could rule better than God. And so these free-willed eternal angels made a choice. They chose to reject God's will and ways and go their own way. But a choice in eternity is an eternal choice. See, when time is not linear, when time is not successive, there is no second chance and they eternally chose not God but the only place that God is not I mean God God is everywhere in heaven his light and his love and life fill all of heaven there is no place in heaven where God is not and so God in his love created a place where Lucifer and his angels could have what they demanded where they could rule apart from God he created a place called hell A place where the light and love and life of God gives way to dark, selfish, self-centered, evil rulership of the creature trying to play God. Still, two-thirds of the angels had not eternally rejected God. So how could God show them not to do this ever again? That, That he could show them the consequences. God created again. God said, let there be light. And the universe was born out of a great explosion right in the middle of heaven. But this universe only had four dimensions. The angels watched and were puzzled. 
It's so much less than heaven. Time only moves in one direction. And instead of the glorious light of God that gives life to all, there is this dim, lesser light called the sun that life depends on. Instead of the the water of life flowing from God's throne that gives life, there is this lesser substance, H2O. And they watched as God created people in his own image to be greater than the angels, eternal creatures who could love and create and serve God. But for a while, he placed them a little lower than the angels. And the angels watched as time unfolded and how God allowed Lucifer and the fallen angels access to this new creation. But why? Why would God allow them to follow Lucifer and be cast out of God's presence, cast out of Eden? Why would he let this happen again? But then the angels began to understand God's love, God's mercy. Because see, these humans only experienced a fraction of the love and grace and joy of heaven, but they only experienced a fraction of the evils and sufferings of hell. And God was hiding beyond their four dimensions and yet always near, drawing, beckoning these creatures, these humans back to himself. This place between heaven and hell was a place where humans created to live eternally began with the knowledge of good and evil. The angels marveled at God's brilliant plan unfolding. He would not abandon humans even though they rejected him. Instead, he would enter their world and pay his own price for justice and righteousness so he could forgive and take back any willing human. God gave them a second chance and a third and a fourth, 70 years of chances to turn back to God, to admit their rebellion and forever live with him. Something impossible for eternal angels who made an eternal choice in God's very presence. So God was teaching the unfallen angels and humans the cost of rebellion, the power of love. And with the knowledge of both good and evil in their collective history, when humans who chose God on earth were brought into eternity, they would forever choose to follow God freely, knowing that small taste of life without God's rule. Now, if you read these three chapters, Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, and Revelation 12, you see something close to the story that I just told you. And as we talk today about hellish near-death experiences and, and how in the world could a loving God create a place like that, I want you to keep that story in mind. I want you to keep that perspective. Because, you know, many people think that hell is eternal punishment for finite sins. And so they say, how could a loving God eternally punish someone for, you know, short time in, on earth? But I think they're missing the point. We are not temporal creatures being given eternal consequences. We are eternal creatures being given temporal chance after chance after chance to choose God. And if you understand this, it answers so many questions about the heart of God. Like how could he allow so much evil and suffering in this life if he really loves us more than any other? You know, I've told some of you this story. I remember when my daughter was five years old and and she fell straight down and hit her head on tile and cracked her skull. And she had internal bleeding. They had to give her, you know, inject her with dye and do a CAT scan. And they found there was bleeding under the skull, which was life-threatening. And so so the next day, they had to do a second CAT scan and inject her with the dye. But when the doctors went to inject her, she screamed and kicked. She was terrified of the shot. And I'm in the room, you know, suffering as my daughter's suffering. The doctor looks at me and says, Dad, you're going to have to hold her down. And I mean, I was dying. I had to go and pin my little girl down as she pleaded with me, Dad, why are you letting them do this to me? Why are you hurting me, Dad? And I had to pin her down, and I was suffering. I was crying, and she was crying. Why would I do that? Well, because I knew this temporary suffering was necessary to prevent her death, to prevent a far greater suffering that she didn't understand. I think God sees that way too from eternity. 
So you know, one out of 25 people, as we've said, have had a near-death experience. And uh, they have died and been resuscitated and said they, they saw something in the life to come. And it's convinced many skeptical doctors. But you know, when these first began to be reported about 40 years ago, initially, only good stories were coming forth. And so everyone was reporting these great experiences. They felt more alive with heightened senses. They saw people who seemed friendly to them. And the researchers declared, it's all good. Everyone goes to heaven. There's nothing to fear. And then slowly, more and more hellish NDEs got reported. Dr. Maurice Rawlings uh, was a cardiologist who did not believe in God, didn't believe in the afterlife, when a 40-year-old man had a cardiac arrest and dropped dead in his office. Three nurses rushed in, began CPR. Dr. Rawlings recalls, I had to insert a pacemaker wire into the large vein. The patient began coming too, but whenever I would reach for instruments and stop compression, he would lose consciousness and die again. Each time he regained heartbeat, he screamed, I'm in hell. He was terrified and pleaded with me to help him. I was scared to death. In fact, this episode literally scared the hell out of me. <laughs> And he said, after, after several resuscitations, the man pleaded, don't you understand? I'm in hell. Each time you quit, I go back there. Don't let me go back to hell. Dr. Rawlings said, I dismissed his complaint and told him to keep his hell to himself until I can get the pacemaker in it. He was serious though. And he said, pray for me. He begged me. I told him I'm a doctor, not a preacher. Pray for me, he repeated. And Dr. Rawlings said, said just to try to quiet the man he drew on his little bit of Sunday school remembrance and though he didn't believe it he had the man repeat Lord Jesus I ask you to keep me out of hell forgive my sins I turn my life over to you if I die I want to go to heaven if I live I'll be on the hook forever <laughs> the patient finally uh, stabilized after having a few more of those episodes after after the um, uh, after the prayer Days later, Dr. Rawlings went and asked him, what were you seeing? What was this hell you were seeing? The patient could not recall any of the unpleasant events, only the pleasant ones after he flatlined after the prayer. Rawlings reflects, apparently the experiences were so frightening they were suppressed far into the subconscious. That event not only changed Dr. Rawlings' beliefs, after doing his own research, he wrote a book called Beyond Death's Door, theorizing that many people have hellish NDEs, but they're suppressed in their memory because they're so traumatic. Now, studies show that positive near-death experiences are largely underreported because people fear being labeled crazy. So just imagine how underreported hellish NDEs would be. Despite this, of those who report near-death experiences, 23% report having negative or hellish experiences. Dutch researcher uh, Dr. Pim van Lommel summarizes, to their horror, people sometimes find themselves pulled into e even deeper into the profound darkness. The NDE ends in the scary atmosphere. Such a terrifying NDE usually produces long-lasting emotional trauma. The exact number of people who experience such a frightening NDE is unknown because they often keep quiet out of shame and guilt. That's disturbing. That disturbs me. Does that disturb you? And I mean, the thing is, most, most people who even do research, they don't want to talk about that. They just rather leave it alone. And quite honestly, I don't want to talk about that. I'd rather leave it alone. But then I started to think that would actually be the most self-centered, unloving thing I could ever do. Because that's about me worried about what you think about me. Not caring about you. Not caring about people. And you know, Jesus taught that hell is just as real as heaven. He spoke of outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He spoke, he spoke of a pit, a black pit. He spoke of a fiery place. He spoke of, a, of a, a levels of a world turned away from God. Now, Jesus also made it clear God doesn't want any human going there. So why would anyone end up there? Jesus explained that too. He said, God's light came into the world, John 3, 19. But people love the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do right come to the light. 
You know, God has made a way to forgive all of us, but sometimes because we fear that guilt and condemnation, we don't turn to God. We run from him and hide from him. Oxford scholar C.S. Lewis, who was an atheist turned believer, believes that God does not send anybody to hell. He says this, I willingly believe that the damned are, in one sense, successful, rebels to the end, that the doors of hell are locked from the inside. Last week, I interviewed Howard Storm. He's a tenured college professor um, who was taking students on a tour of Paris when his stomach ruptured and unable to get surgery, he died. And at first, like many NDEs, he felt great. Remember, if you were here, he felt more alive than ever. He met these friendly people, this friendly welcoming committee. If it had stopped there, it would have been like any other heavenly kind of experience. But I think that's important to realize first appearances can be deceiving in this world and in the world to come. Listen to what Howard goes on to describe. It's a little longer story, but I think it's important to listen. I had known from some time in that afternoon that I was dying. Um, I knew absolutely, but I didn't want to die because I was an atheist and I was... uh, I knew that uh, I was terrified of it because dying means the end of everything. I was a 38-year-old college professor. Um, my work was shown in some museums. You know, I'd won some prizes. You know, I had a wife and two kids and, you know, a career. And, and I, you know, one of the thoughts that kept going through, how could this happen? How can this possibly happen? It's not supposed to happen. Mm. And I went unconscious. I awoke from that. And... I felt wonderful, unlike I'd ever felt in my entire life. Wait, so you knew you died, and suddenly you felt great? Well, I didn't know I'd died. I just, I'd been unconscious, and now I feel great, you know? And where were you? Standing next to the bed, upright, and I, the first thing, I was like, why do I feel so good? I just felt the worst I'd ever felt in my entire life. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't breathe, and now I'm like Superman, <laughs> and my eyesight, my hearing, my taste, my smell, and I'm, and I'm thinking about my senses, and I can... So, so you I, still don't know you're dead? No. And you feel I alive? This out. You feel I feel good? more alive than I've ever felt in my entire life. And uh, I heard people calling me um, in English kind of nicely, you know, Howard, Howard, come here, come here. So I go over to the doorway of the room, and in the hallway is gray. It's um, very unclear, like a terrible black and white TV picture. And there's men and women standing far away from the light of the doorway. And I said, I'm sick. I need to have surgery. I've been waiting all day for a doctor. Um, And they said, we know all about you. Hurry. Come with us now. We can't wait any longer. Come. Come. Hurry. Hurry. As we went, it got darker and darker, and they came in closer and closer, and more and more of them were around me. And now, as I asked them questions like, where are we going, how much further, things like that, they started to become more rude and say things to me like, shut up. Don't ask questions. You'll find out. You don't need to know. Keep moving. Keep moving. Move it. You know, like that. And I'm like, getting pretty intimidated, that becomes fear, that becomes terror, and what they were doing was just playing with me, toying with me. Um, And at first it was pushing, kicking, pulling, hitting, and then that became biting and tearing with their fingernails and hands, and they were taking pieces of me. And there was a lot of laughter, a lot of very foul language. And then they became more invasive. And I don't ever go further with this because it was so demeaning. I mean, I don't talk about it any further. 
And in that place, I heard a voice, which I identify as my voice, except that it did not come out of my throat, off my lips. But I do feel, I, it's strange, but I feel like it came out of my chest. This voice said, pray to God. And I thought, I don't believe in God. I don't pray. The voice said, pray to God. And I thought, I don't even know how to pray. I couldn't pray if I wanted to pray. The voice said, pray to God. But you, so, you couldn't find one at that Well, point? I, I found the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, <laughs> and then I found later, I found, um, yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I'll fear no evil. Um, stuff like that. And uh, our Father who art in heaven. I remember like these phrases out of prayers. And I start to mutter this stuff and the people around me absolutely can't bear it. Now, this made me want to pray more because for the first time I was able to hit back at them. The prayers were like clobbering them. This is the horrible part, um, that the people that had met me were my kindred spirit. Now, I do not know if I knew any of those people in this world prior to this experience. That's not what I'm trying to say. They were my brothers and sisters in spirit. What do you mean by that? They denied God. They lived for themselves. And their lives were about manipulation and control of other people. As a son to my mother and father, I had failed them. My father and I had no relationship. And my poor mother, um, because my, my dad and I not speaking to each other, she was, um, you know, we couldn't have any, much of a relationship. I hardly ever saw her. I had a very poor relationship with my sisters. Um, I had not been a good husband to my wife, and you can use your imagination to figure out what that means. Um, but it's, that's true. That's all true. Mm -hmm. um, I had not been the father to my kids that I should have been, and I knew I hadn't because I was busy. I was trying to be somebody, mm -hmm. you know, like the football games and the band concerts and the choral concerts and the theater performances. That could all wait because I was busy being important. Mm. I was doing stuff, making myself into somebody in that this memory comes of myself as a little boy sitting in a Sunday school classroom singing, Jesus loves me. Why would he care? He must hate me. I'm so sorry. Mm. And I thought, Enough of this. I'm done. I don't have anything else. Jesus, please save me. And when I said that, I saw a light, tiny little speck of light, and it very rapidly got very bright and came over me. And I saw out of the light, hands and arms emerge out of this impossibly beautiful white light. And these hands and arms came out and they reached down and they touched me. And when they touched me, um, in that light, I could see me and all the gore, and I was roadkill, all that gore began to just dissolve and I became whole. And much more significantly to me than was the physical healing was that I was experiencing a love that is beyond far beyond words. If, if I, I've never been able to articulate it, but I can say that if I took all my experience of love in my entire life and could condense it into a moment, it still wouldn't begin to measure up to the intensity of this love that I was feeling. And when those arms went on me and healed me, they went behind my back and he picked me up as if it was no effort on his part. He just gently picked me up and held me up against him real tight, up against his chest. So there I am with my arms around him, his arms around me, and I am bawling like a baby, and I am slobbering and snotting and drooling with my head buried in his chest, and he starts to rub my back. Like, he wasn't saying there, there, but it was just like, like a mom or a dad with a child. And I knew, I don't, I don't know how I knew, but I knew that he loved me very much just the way I was. Later in this experience, we did a life review and he made perfectly 
clear what he did not like, and I can safely say despised, hated, mm. detested about my, what I had done with my life, but he always loved me. God loves you like no other. And I, I got to tell you, you know, when, I, when I've sat with these people, I mean, these experiences happened years ago, but you can see it's just as real today as, as it was then. Jesus explained in Matthew 25, hell was not created for people. It's created for the devil and his angels. They had a free will. We have a free will. Both species were created to love God and experience his love and goodness forever. Angels made an eternal choice. There is no second chance. There's no such thing in eternity. We've made the same choice, but we get a second and a third. In some cases, a lifetime of chances to turn back to God. And God allows, in his mercy, suffering and pain as a warning. Because isn't it true that many times until it gets so painful, we will not look up? In our stubborn pride, we really think we can rule and live without God. But he loves us so much, he'll even allow us to go through pain and suffering in hopes that we won't cling to our stubborn pride. You know, the reason I think Howard and others could still choose I believe is because they hadn't crossed that boundary or that border we've talked about into eternity because they all still came back, right? That's how we know about this. But God gives us all a way to be restored eternally just by a simple turn of the heart. It says this in Romans 3, 23 through 26. Everyone has sinned, everyone. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God freely and graciously declares that we are righteous. It's amazing. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe or trust that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood for you, for me. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past, for he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just and declares sinners to be right in his sight when they trust or believe in Jesus. You know, all the world's religions basically tell us the same thing about morality. It's all basically the same moral standards. And yet, what does that teach us? It teaches us we've all sinned. No one has ever perfectly kept the Buddhist eightfold path or the five pillars of Islam or the Ten Commandments. Shoot, I mean, we don't even keep our own moral laws, right? You ever said, I'll never, and yet you did? You ever let yourself down? Yeah, all of us. And yet God in his great love and mercy paid his own price for justice, so that he would be just in taking back any people who recognize they need forgiveness and turn their hearts back to him. That's what he was doing through Jesus' payment. He removed every barrier between every human and himself except our free will. He won't force us to love or accept his gift of, of, of his loving forgiveness for eternity because love must be free to choose. Now here's what else we need to realize? There are many fallen angels, demonic spiritual beings that are void of the love of God. They're consumed with their own desires. They lie to us. You know, misery loves company. <laughs> and they love to lie. Jesus said it this way in John 8, 31. You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And then later he says, Lucifer has always hated the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he's a liar and the father of lies. You know, friends, this is exactly why in the scriptures God tells us, do not contact the dead. Don't seek to have out-of-body experiences, you know, that, that mimic these NDEs. Don't go seeking spirit guides. Why? Because he also says that 
Satan and his demons can masquerade as angels of light. And so when you do that, you're opening yourself up to a spiritual world that is bent on deceiving you. It says this in Isaiah 8, 19. Should the living seek guidance from the dead? Look to God's instructions and teachings. People who contradict his word are completely in the dark. Look, God makes it clear. You know, Jesus said, it is not my heavenly father's will that even one of these little ones perish. God has done everything he can to bring every person back to him. Now, one of Satan's lies is to get us to think, well, that can't be fair. Because what about people who have never heard of Jesus? And we get so worried about these people we don't even know, right? That we don't, we don't even think about Jesus at all and what he's done for us. We're like, forget it. That's stupid. But stop and think about what that lie is designed to do. You know, with the smoke screen of caring about people that you don't know, you know, and God says he knows them and loves them enough to die for them. And yet with, with that idea, we will completely reject what God has done for us. Don't do that. The truth is the Bible doesn't tell us uh, how God deals with those who have never heard about Jesus. He doesn't make that clear. We know people from the Old Testament who never heard about him by faith somehow through what he did were made right. That's what we read just before in, in, in Romans 3. But we also know this. Jesus said, anyone who rejects me, in other words, if you have heard what he's done, you reject him outright, is rejecting God who sent me. So don't reject Jesus because you're worried about people you don't even know. That's a lie designed to deceive you. The only people we can really worry about first is ourselves. And by the way, God tells us that in heaven, somehow there will be people from every tribe and every language. So don't judge God, seek God. You know, God is doing all this because he's teaching us as humans why we need to forever choose him. He's also teaching the angels as they serve us it says in Ephesians 3, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Through earth's suffering, God is birthing eternally free children and he's teaching the unfallen angels to forever choose to love him. That's why Jesus still has the marks on his hands and his feet in heaven because we all need to remember well, I want you to hear uh, today from one more person, a friend of mine, actually. Uh, I've known him for about six years. He's a pastor here in Austin who started a church 11 years ago, um, but he didn't start there. And so I want, I want to ask you to help me welcome up Paul Ojeda, good friend of mine. Not Paul Ojeda. <laughs> Paul Ojeda, right? <laughs> John Berkey, right? That's right, John Berkey. <laughs> so, uh, Paul, you know, um, we've been friends now, what, five or six years? Yeah, something like that. Correct. And you had told me that you had never even heard of a thing called a near-death experience in, until you and I talked. That's right, that's and, right. And yet you had had one. Yes, that's correct. Why don't you take us back to that day and tell us how you got there and what happened? I would love to. Well, let me take you back to the beginning. In 1997, my wife and I met in a drug rehab. I tell people that I was bad, she was bad, and together we became worse. <laughs> we went to AA, NA, CA. We went to all the A's. Uh, <laughs> we AAA? went to AAA. <laughs> it's a tow truck company. They would have just hauled us off. <laughs> but we were, needless to say, we were in bad shape. Uh, my wife is from Brazil, and she had came to this country when she was uh, a teenager with the church, and God told her that she was going to marry a pastor and do great things for the Lord. So we're sitting there with a plate full of cocaine, and she begins to tell me what God had told her. So even after rehab, you got back into drugs? After rehab, we got back into drugs. I'm sitting there with a plate full of cocaine. She begins to tell me the vision she had as a child, or when she was a teenager and came to America. I looked at her and I said, I believe you got the wrong guy because uh, I'm a little Catholic boy and we're just drive-by Christians. I just, that so that's it. all I know about Jesus or God. Uh, 
After, immediately after she tells me that, uh, as I'm there, I have a cocaine overdose. And when I had this overdose, I heard this voice that said, just give up, let go. And at the same token, I heard this other voice that says, fight to live. But at that point, I just felt that if I died, it would all come to an end. The misery would stop and everything would be done with. Uh, but it wasn't. Immediately, as they were lifting me up, putting me in the ambulance, and my wife was getting in, and we were headed to the hospital, uh, I flatlined. They, they lost me. And so as I died, immediately I wake up, and I'm in this totally different place. It felt like somebody grabbed me and dropped me in this outer darkness, and I start racing down this bottomless pit. As I'm racing down this pit, which seems like forever, it's the blackest, blackest, darkest, darkest. And as I'm racing down there, it's, it's then when I realize, hey, I'm, I'm going to hell. But I said, well, there's something wrong. I, I mean, I shouldn't be going to hell. I'm not a bad person. I didn't kill anybody. I, I didn't do anything really that bad. And it seemed like as I began to justify myself, this thing went faster and faster with every time I try to justify my actions and who I was. It's at that point I thought, you know, I, I really got scared because I realized that I was going to hell. I, was, I had no control of this, and I didn't want to go to hell. I cried out to the Lord and said, God, I really need you at this point. And then all of a sudden I feel the Spirit of the Lord come next to me. I didn't see a face or anything. I just felt his presence. And in the darkest hour when God showed up, there was this peace. It felt like all of a sudden everything stopped and stand still. Like you stopped dropping? That's correct. And it just felt God's presence right next to me. And all of a sudden, God asked me a question I'll never forget as long as I live. He says, Paul, what have you done with the life I've given to you? At that point, I began to think, you know, I better answer this question correctly because my eternity <laughs> laughed. So here I'm trying to figure out what's the right answer. Uh -huh. And as I'm thinking about it, I knew what Adam felt like to be before God because it felt totally exposed, totally naked before the Lord. Because every motive, every thought, every intention that I had, it's like God could see it before I could even think it. And so before I could even open my mouth and say anything, my whole life flashed in front of me as big as the sky is. It was then that I realized that lived for me, myself, and I, and that was my trinity. It was the worst moment of my life. Because it was then that I realized um, the shame that I had before the Lord. I never gave him glory or honor, never acknowledged him. I was a selfish man. Did you, you know, some people talk about that life review and it's like you literally re-experience it. Was it like, like that? It was, it was. It was and, and I realized that it was God because we all have deep, dark secrets. And in that film... God didn't miss a beat. He showed me everything good and bad I did. At that point, I was 30 years old, so from childhood all the way. And, and, in, and when, you know, eternity is different from this time. Everything went so fast and yet so slow, and I didn't miss anything. It was then that I realized that I deserve hell. And I told God, I said, you are just in sending me to hell. I'm a sinner. I'm, I've done nothing with this life, but God, if you would please... Allow me to come back and tell the world, because I don't want anybody to come to this place. I said, God, I just want to tell the world that there's a heaven and a hell, nothing in between. Tell them about your love and your mercy and who you are. And all of a sudden, bam, I wake up, I got the IVs, I'm in the hospital. I look at Lillian and I told her, I said, I found that God you've been telling me about, and from this day forward, I'm going to serve him. And, and from there, you guys, you said you found the... Um, Spanish-speaking church where you actually gave your life to Christ? I did. As a matter of fact, I was so hungry for the Lord. My wife speaks Portuguese. Uh, I speak English. But for some reason, because I'm Mexican-American, she thought I was like all Mexican. I speak nothing but Spanish. <laughs> she says, no, Paul, you're Mexican. <laughs> so we went to a Spanish church. But you don't speak much but Spanish. But I don't speak much Spanish. <laughs> So God, God was, did a miracle, huh? He did a miracle. <laughs> I was hungry for the Lord. <laughs> well, and, you know, what's amazing about, about your story is I know, you know, Paul, 
Paul lived in Houston, and he, he, uh, he's a master plumber. He had an incredible business there. Lived on a golf course, right? That's right. That's I right. mean, you, you had the life. That's right. Um, and I remember you told me about how one of Lillian's, was it her friend or sister or someone in Austin That's called right, you sister. one night? Uh-huh. Um, suicidal? Yeah. Or some, and, and you led her to the Lord on the phone and then started traveling back and forth. Back and forth. Yeah. And that eventually you decided to leave your, your plumbing business and move to Austin. Tell, tell us what's happened since then. Well, uh, you know, God had moved on my heart and told us. We, we uh, had a, a plumbing company. We were doing really well. And I told Lillian, I said, you know, God gave me a vision. We need to come to Austin, open a church. And uh, at that time we were doing really well. So she says, Paul, the devil is a liar. <laughs> So we packed everything up. We came to Austin. We start from scratch. That was back July the 18th, 2004. And since then, God has really blessed our ministry. We have a campus in San Marcos, one in South Austin. Just recently opened one up in uh, North Austin. We've seen thousands of people come to the Lord, get set free from drug addictions and all kinds of stuff. And so, you know, the power of God has really moved uh, through that testimony. Yeah. Yeah, and it's and been it's, it's amazing, been amazing what God has done through you. And so Paul and I served together um, in in this uh, group of pastors called Christ Together, um, helping unite churches across Austin to serve our city. And so he's become a very dear friend. Thank you so much. Let's thank Paul for being here and sharing with us. Thank you. You know, um, here's what I hope you take from this today, is that, you know, if if you are a follower of Jesus, you got to know that this stuff is real, and the life we live is temporary, it's short, And, and, and it's not meant to be the thing we hang on to. Instead, it's meant to be what we use to serve and love God. And we're going to talk about next week how that counts for eternity. I mean, Jesus made it clear there are rewards for eternity. And and, and spoiler alert, it's not boring. (laughs) But the other thing you need to know is if you've never, you know, if, if this scares the hell out of you like it did Dr. Rawlings, Jesus wants you to know and know and know that you're right with God. That's why he did what he did on the cross. So that we could know, not wonder, know. And he's made it so simple, all you have to do is turn your heart back to him. Don't wait until you're rock bottom. You don't have to wait till you're rock bottom. And God's desire is not to scare us into loving him and turn to him. He gives us all the good gifts of life, hoping that we'll acknowledge him. But unfortunately, in our stubborn pride, sometimes it does take hitting rock bottom but it doesn't have to. And so I'm gonna lead us in a prayer right now. And I wanna encourage you, wherever you are, you know, to just commit your heart and your life to God and to commit to following him because his ways are good and, and the payoff is eternal. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much that you have loved every one of us so much that you don't hold our wrongs against us And truly, there's only one sin, and it's that we turn from you and think we can live apart from the God who gave us life. We somehow think that seeking our will and ways over your will and ways is good and right and will bring us the greatest joy and the greatest life, and it's a lie. Thank you, God, that you forgive us because of what Jesus did. And so we just want to say we want what Jesus did to count for us. We want your forgiveness. We want your guidance through this life. Come be God of our lives again. And God, if we've, if we've turned away, thank you that you never let go of us. Once we turn our hearts back to you, you assure us that we will always be right with you. But you want us when we fall and when we fail to get back up, let you pick us back up every moment of every day. And even if we fail 70 times seven, you forgive us 70 times seven times so that we can get back up and grow and walk and run with you. Help us be people who become more like you 
day by day, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, before you go, I want to encourage you, uh, take the Starting Gate Tour right over there, 15 minutes, uh, if you never have. Also, there'll be a prayer team up here who would love to pray for you. If you need prayer, otherwise, have a great Sunday.